which is uh, the buzz in, in many parts of uh, uh, the energy world. I'm going to set out in conclusion to actually a, a, a sort of 10 point plan for the government, but I'll probably rattle through that at the end and, and leave it for you to read afterwards if, if you want. Um, so that's the territory. The context is really to recognise that we have not much time to change the way um, that societies operate. Uh, this is a quote from the UK chief scientist from just last year. Um, political and business leaders have just 20 years to prepare for a perfect storm, perhaps not the ideal analogy, but uh, that was the one, of climate change related impacts on food, water, energy supplies, or risk public unrest, conflict, and mass migration. He wasn't mincing his words, as John Bennington at that point. I'm not going to go into the detail and the theory of climate change. I'm going to assume that we don't have any sceptics or, or denialists in the room. If you want to ask that in the question session at the end, and, and we'll have a discussion, but for the purposes of this lecture, let's assume that the scientists are right and that climate change is real and a pressing threat. Um, I'm also not going to talk at any great length about peak oil, although that is the other bit of the context that I want to share with you. Um, I think it's highly likely that oil reserves in the world as a whole, and, and indeed gas reserves, are going to portray the same pattern as happened in the US as identified by Hubbard. Um, I think we're seeing the results of that very clearly with companies already trying to exploit unconventional sources of gas, shale gas in particular, and unconventional sources of oil, the tar sands of, a, of Athabasca being a principal example there. But from my perspective, whether or not peak oil is, is, is a pressing problem, we know already that for climate change purposes, we cannot afford to burn all the reserves of fossil fuels that humans have already found. So the, the problem is more pressing than the problem of peak oil, um, although that may be the one that changes business behaviours more quickly. Um, and of course, focusing on climate is in itself quite dangerous because we may well end up even if we successfully tackle climate change, with crises in the availability of fertile soil or the availability of clean water. And these are the facts, factors that I think underlie John Bennington's quote here, which is why I've spent quite so much time on it. Um, so for me, the question is not whether Scotland has to, and, and indeed the world in the, in the long run, has to decarbonise but how and how quickly. And let me say a little bit, what do I mean by decarbonisation? It's a bit of jargon that uh, in the environmental movement everyone slipped into using in the last couple of years. What it means is doing the things we do with either non or virtually no carbon dioxide greenhouse gas emissions associated with it. The UK Committee on Climate Change um, pretty much coined the term and popularised it and they talk about a target for 2030 for the UK for virtually decarbonising our electricity generation system. And by that they mean reducing the amount of greenhouse gases associated with that by at least 90%. So there's a, there's a potential residual. It's not absolutely nothing from their perspective, but it's getting close to it. Um, and... The reality of climate change and the targets we've adopted in Scotland, 42% reduction by 2020, 80% reduction by 2050, across the whole economy, mean that the question is, as I say, not whether, but how. And that means there's key, key decisions to be made really right now about how we develop our renewable energy potential, how we go about decarbonising heat and transport, um, whether we allow developers to build particular new facilities like the Hunterston coal-fired power station or the biomass plants that are proposed here in Dundee and in three other locations, whether the nuclear power station should be allowed to extend their, their operating lives and 
behind all of those, how we should finance that, whether it should be through charges on consumers or in other ways. So, big questions. I'm afraid I'm not going to answer all of those questions, um, but I think this is a, a, a central challenge. Um, last year, Friends of the Earth Scotland commissioned Garrett Hassan. And Garrett Hassan are a, a renewable energy consultancy. Indeed, they're probably one of the world's leading renewable energy consultancies. They're based here in, in Glasgow, but they have offices in several countries around the world, including in China, um, one of Scotland's successful exports to China. Um, Last year we got them to produce a report that we called the Power of Scotland Renewed. And that suggested that with a judicious mix of energy efficiency, running about 1.5%, 2% a year, and a continuation of trends in the development of our renewable energy electricity capacity, we could get to um, this sort of virtual decarbonisation by 2030. They suggested the system could be secure if we had the right mix of interconnection, deferrable demand, and electricity storage, but they didn't quantify that. So the key thing that we went back to them this year with was the question of security of supply, and that's why the new report is called the Paris Scotland Secure. Um, and that, I think we can see why that's so important, because opponents of renewable energy and just those who, who may be sceptical and wish to question things, have seized on the question of variability and intermittency of things like wind power as a reason to say, well, we don't think this can be, can be done. Um, and in just recent weeks, you may have noticed the sort of furore about Rupert Soames' remarks um, criticising renewable energy policy, which is fairly rich coming from the director of the one company in the FTSE 100, that does not publish its climate change emissions. There is no other. It's only his company, Agrico, that uh, doesn't do that anymore. Um, but perhaps more typical, a member of the public wrote to the Herald two days ago. He's called Brian Samuel. He arrived in Scotland to work on the Hunterston nuclear plant, to help build it. And he was asking, how will we meet our energy needs when Hunterston B is closed if the wind isn't blowing? Um, and it's, it's a natural question to ask if you're not sort of steeped in, in the intricacies of the energy system. So we asked Garrett Hassan to look at this, and we asked them to look at it particularly in the context of the European Climate Foundation's recent research, which looks at this issue for the whole of Europe. Um, interestingly, they say by 2050, so a bit further out, that the whole of Europe could be using... Um, essentially 100% renewable power. When you look into the detail of that, they acknowledge that there would be a small amount of conventional coal-fired or gas-fired power used as backup, running for no more than about 8 or 10% of the year. So much less than it's, it's used now, but the capacity would be there. And, but the, the key for Europe was that we could balance the solar resources of the southern part of Europe with the wind and marine resources from the northern part to achieve um, a fairly reliable supply of energy from renewable sources as long as we built a grid, an electricity grid, across the whole of Europe to make sure to, to distribute that, that electricity. So it was particularly interesting to have a look at Scotland in that context, given Scotland has a very high proportion of um, Europe's marine and wind resource. So if their vision for Europe is going to come true, it's going to have to come true and be able to come true in Scotland. Um, I'll just put this up as, as much to say, hey, it's complicated. Um, but really to remind people, because it's very easy, politicians do it all the time, to mix up energy and electricity. Um, and I do it sometimes, so forgive me if I do tonight. But electricity is not the only part of our energy system, and indeed it's the minority. Only 20% of the power we use at the end of the system <coughs> is electrical, about 30% of it is diesel and petrol in vehicles, and about 50% of it is in the form of heat, um, heating for 
space heating for our, our 